Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the first in-person um, CDT student-led conference. This is Impact 2021. Um, today we're going to be having a couple of talks from the second year PhD students just going over their uh, research and what they're currently working on. But first we're going to have a quick talk from Peter Smoten just to tell us a bit more about the um, CDT in general. So Peter, please hit the floor. Thank you. Uh, let's see if that works. So I didn't really know what to say. So I thought there may just be somebody here that isn't familiar with the CDT. So I'm going to go through it. Uh, so please excuse me for those people who are way too familiar with it. Uh, so it's a one plus three uh, affair. I'm not sure where to stand. Uh, so the first year is an MSc uh, in either compound semiconductor physics, which is really photonics, or compound semiconductor electronics. And we really try and emphasize the practical clean room training and then some other extra elements such as a journal club and, and seminars. And some of those seminars are presented by our industrial partners. And we're really grateful to those industrial partners because that's a key part of uh, you know, spreading knowledge about how the whole ecosystem works to our, our students. Uh, we have these four universities, uh, and I'm not sure I can say this. Can I say this? I think I can say it. Four best universities in, in the UK working on compound semiconductors. Uh, and they've all got excellent research facilities, so it really gives students a chance to work at any one of those universities, or in fact, at, at more than one of those universities uh, to, to use those facilities. And then finally, we've got uh, very strong links with uh, future employers. Uh, so the vision, uh, the CET is part of a strategic activity to develop a cluster in South Wales on compound semiconductors, but it's a cluster that supports the whole of the UK. It's not, not just South Wales. Uh, and what we really want to achieve is we want to change the way that people do research in the UK. Uh, first of all, by making sure that everybody understands the entire manufacturing supply chain before they focus on a particular part of it, uh, but also by embedding manufacturability in the research solutions from day one. So let's not invent and spend lots of time developing something that will never be of use because we can't make it. Let's think about that right from the start. Uh, as I said, we really do have this focus on hands-on skills, design, fabrication, uh, uh, characterization, and finally, we really want to learn about the manufacturing approaches that are used in the silicon industry, because we believe those are the, the approaches that are going to be used as the next stage in the compound semiconductor industry. And then finally, again, linking between industry and academic researchers. And the way we really, really want to do that, and one of the key ways we want to do that, other than the seminars I've spoken about already, is by having co-development of PhD projects. So an, an academic or academics and an industrial supervisor will come up with an initial idea, but the idea then is that during that first year, there's co-development of that project, project planning, et cetera, et cetera, between the postgraduates, the academic supervisors, and the industry partners. And so where does that fit in the program? Uh, as I said, it's this one first year, which is largely an MSc, lots of talk courses. But during that first, first year, we talk about those initial project ideas. That comes up actually starting in December, which is why we've been pressurizing everybody to get their project ideas sorted out very, very soon. Uh, people make choices about what they want to do. We have interviews if, if, there, if there are more than one person wants to do the same project. And then by March and May, we're ready to get going on the actual uh, projects, doing that project planning, doing the responsible research and innovation on what might come out of the project, uh, doing, doing all, the, all the analysis of what the risks and, and problems may be, doing literature search, et cetera, so that the MSc project at the end of that first year, which is usually designed to support the PhD and the PhD project really hit the ground running and we get going fast so that the PhD can be completed in years two, three, and four, uh, where there are also some uh, further skills activities as well. So... Uh, as I said, this is part of a, a sort of log, larger ecosystem. So we want to, uh, to uh, generally, in terms of research, we want to make some compound semiconductors more widely used. They're incredibly widely used already, but we want to do that even more. And so we need to reduce the cost, 
by increasing the volume of production, use the approaches of silicon to scale up and do things like generic functionality. Uh, we want to develop integrated compound semiconductors and silicon manufacturing, so that's things like growing compound semiconductors on silicon. And we want to make sure that any progress we make in one family of compound semiconductors is spread across the different families. So if we learn something making gallium nitride, we see if it works well for, say, gallium arsenide. Uh, and then finally, we want to change this UK academic mindset. This is for us old people. We need to change the way they think, and that's pretty tough to do. So that's why we want all the CDT students coming through with this new way of thinking about the manufacturability of, of research right from the start. And then finally, you'll be glad I'm going to shut up because I've, oh, I'm sure I've been going on too long and you haven't been shouting at me, but you, you, yes, I have, okay. Manufacturing supply chains. This is what I'm really talking about. From the epitaxial growth of the wafer, or even before, even the materials before, all the way through the, the fabrication, the 3D structuring, creation of devices, the evaluation models, the subsystems, to the final application, whatever it is, be it electric car or, or, or large-scale manufacturing lines, metal bashing, if you like, but doing it in a very, very intelligent way with these compound semiconductor sensors. We want people to know about this whole, whole line and how innovation in, along the whole process can really create some real benefit at the end. But before they delve into the real intricacies of, say, one particular area like epitaxial growth. And within the ecosystem, we have research going on. All four universities can do epitaxial growth. They can all do fabrication. They can all do subsystems. But they also connect through the CS hub to the catapult. Uh, and we also then connect to small-scale manufacturing as well. So CSC, Institute of Compound Semiconductors, can do, even do small-scale manufacturing. Uh, and then, of course, we also translate then to large-scale manufacturing in the region as well. OK, that's me done. I really am going to shut up. I do apologize, Tom. Here you go. Thank you so much, Peter. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so next up, we have our first talk. Our first talk is going to be from Tristan Burnham. He is working on indium phosphide etching, um, sponsored by SPTS and supervised by Peter Smoten. So Tristan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Tom. Right. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the applications of high quality indium phosphide etching pro uh, process. So brief outline, we're going to quickly look over some of the uh, ICP uh, etching process where it involves some of the different parameters that we can change and the effects that that has on the etch. We'll look quickly at some of the difficulties, particularly with regards to indium phosphide, and then some of the applications that we'd have if we were to optimize this process sufficiently. So indium phosphide etching. So here's a schematic of a typical ICP chamber. The wafers are loaded in through the side. They are placed down onto the center on a heated table uh, to essentially control the temperature, which is very important for indium phosphide, which we'll get to a little bit later. Gases are allowed to flow into the chamber. Once the gas flow is stabilized, we increase the source power which is the top RF matching unit to ignite the plasma. We then wait, once the plasma is stable, we then turn on a platinum power, which is this bottom one, which then drags the ions from the plasma down onto the surface of the wafer. This allows independent control of the chemical and physical etching processes of plasma etching. So when you are developing one of these processes, your first consideration needs to be your gas chemistry. Now for indium phosphide processing, there are essentially two different uh, main approaches. The first is a methane-based uh, chemistry, the other is a chlorine-based chemistry. The methane one, uh, it's a little bit more well-established in industry. Um, it has much higher etch rates than the chlorine chemistry does, uh, and it has a wider process window, so it's a lot less sensitive to subtle changes in the process. But it does create a uh, polymer that coats the surface of the wafer and the insides of the chambers, which means that your device um, processing, you need to add in additional stages to remove this polymer. And from a manufacturing point of view, after so many runs, you need to open up the chamber and clean the inside of the chamber to maintain your performance. Chlorine, the chlorine chemistry doesn't have these disadvantages, but it has a slower etch rate and it's typically a lot more sensitive to very subtle changes in the etch profile, uh, the etch process. 
So once you've decided on your chemistry, in this case, we've been focusing on the chlorine argon uh, chemistry. Your next consideration is your gas ratios. As you can see, by alternating the ratios, so in this case, the chlorine to argon ratio, you can get very different etch profiles. So this just highlights how important it is that you really spend time thinking about your ratios. Are they correct? Do you want more chemical etch? Do you want the more physical etch? In the work that I'm doing on, uh, in the work that I'm working on, we are aiming for this uh, top left, uh, well, top right uh, image. So the smooth vertical profile. So your first parameter that you really need to consider is the powers, particularly in this case, the source power. Now, as you increase the source power, you're gonna strip more electrons from the gases that are in the chamber, creating more ions, and therefore having a more reactive species in your chamber to etch the material. As you increase this, you get faster etch rate, so you end up with deeper etches, but you also end up with a more chemical etch, so you get this undercut profile. The next one is platinum power. So this is the pull of the ions from the plasma. As they come down, as you, sorry, as you increase the platinum power, you increase the energy of these ions. They impact the surface harder, which leads to greater physical action. Now, not only does it hit harder, but it also hits at an angle closer to perpendicular, which means we get more vertical etch processes. And again, as you're hitting harder, you get the increased etch rate. So you get these deeper etches. Chamber pressure has a surprising effect um, because as you increase your chamber pressure, you get more ions available to you. So you get a faster etch rate. However, if you go too high, you have now increased the likelihood that one of these ions coming down towards the surface of your wafer will deflect off a molecule in the chamber. And now you have an undercutting effect. So again, it's all about balance between these two extremes when you're talking about etching. Temperature is considered to be probably the most important for indium phosphide etching. So when your chlorine ions, uh, ions come into contact with the surface of your indium phosphide sample, it bonds with the indium phosphide and other materials in your structures, which creates chlorides. Most of these chlorides are very volatile and we don't really need to worry about them. But the indium chloride uh, compound in particular is not very volatile and we must increase the temperature to get it to evaporate back off the surface. If your temperatures are too low, this compound doesn't evaporate and you effectively remove the chemical etch component as now you have a layer of indium chloride preventing the ions reaching the indium phosphide. If your temperature goes too high, the indium chloride evaporates far too quickly and now you have no protection on the side walls of your etch which means you have an overly chemical process, which again, you get these very smooth but undercut profiles. So again, emphasizing it's a balance between these two extremes. We are looking for something that can provide us a vertical profile, but still smooth. So going on to some of the difficulties of Indian phosphide etching. So the our parameters that you've seen so far, you can think of them as sliders. As you move them from one extreme to the other, you get slightly different effects. And each one of these parameters effectively has a Goldilocks zone of where you want each one to be. Now, for example, if we were to increase platen power, we're not entirely unsure on the effect this would have on the other parameters. And we may find that the Goldilocks region in other areas shifts. Now, this is one of the difficulties because this process is so sensitive. Um, yeah, so because this process is so sensitive, we don't know how these variables all interact with each other. Now, etching is a pattern transfer process, which means if you have a poor quality mask, you are going to end up with a poor quality etch. The etch can only be as good as the mask that came before it. Any defects, any micro masking or that, or, or anything along those lines will affect your etch quality, as you can see here, with the defects that run up along the side of this ridge. So when you are optimizing an indium phosphide etching process, you need to make sure that you're optimizing the entire process all the way back to your application of your photoresist and your hard mask opening. Recipe transfer is another uh, point worth mentioning. So uh, as you, you may have refined your recipe for one particular process for one mask, as you move to different wafer sizes, different etch depth, different uh, open areas of your mask, you may find that you may, may need to subtly change your recipe to get optimum results. This is not necessarily in all, this is not necessary in all cases, but depending on how close some etches are 
depends on the severity that you need to re-optimize your etch. Now, one of the largest reasons why um, extensive studies into indium phosphide etching hasn't occurred is simply the cost of the material. Indium phosphide is an incredibly expensive material with one wafer can cost in, in the range of five times other three, five materials. Given that it can take in the range of 15 runs to truly optimize a process, you're looking at a 75%, a 75 times increase in your costs just on material alone. So this is why a lot of people like to stray away from trying to study all aspects of the chemical, uh, all aspects of the ICTH and focus in on one or two in particular, which is why we know how a particular variable changes, but not how they interact with others. So when we normally end up in a scenario where material is expensive or material is limited, we break up our uh, material into these coupons and we place them on carrier wafers. Now, as has been said before, indium phosphide is an incredibly sensitive etch. We know that the material of the carrier wafer can impact your etch quality. So in our most recent test, we decided to run an indium phosphide carrier of the same material to etch indium phosphide tiles. It turns out that this is still not quite close enough because from our tests, we found that even though it was the same material operating on the same machine with the same recipes, we got drastically different results with uh, the uh, coupon on the carrier wafer having much higher etch rates, having much higher profile uh, uh, sidewall roughnesses and having a completely different uh, profile to the waveguides. Now, this, we're not entirely sure of the reasoning for this. Um, we believe that the best guess so far is uh, to do with temperature. So as we are heating the carrier, the heat is not transferring to the coupon that is placed on top. So further work is going to be looking into um, if bonding them will help this uh, heat transfer or uh, if the coupon is even reaching temperature to begin with. So applications of one of these processes. So our first one, our main one at the moment is etched facet lasers. So currently uh, lasers are produced by a cleaving. So it involves breaking the wafer to create the facets. This is very, very smooth facets, which lead to very, very high reflectivities. Etch facets, depending on the material and the process, can have roughnesses in the low single, uh, sorry, high single digits to around the mid 30s, which can have anywhere between a five to 50% impact on your uh, reflectivity of that facet. Now, bearing in mind, this doesn't account for effects such as the actual shape of the profile or the angle of the facet, which would lead to further reductions in this uh, reflectivity. If we can get etched facet lasers, we would end up, we can uh, start looking into integrating them into optoelectronic devices. This will, uh, so it's widely considered that uh, lasers would be the diff most difficult ones due to the need to break the wafer to produce the facets and the sensitivity of the devices themselves. So if we can produce a method that is suitable for integrating lasers, it only seems sensible that other components could follow on from this. Now, it's not only devices that share the advantage of this improved process. We could also apply it to the manufacturing process as a whole. So currently, if we were manufacturing wafers, uh, uh, waveguide lasers, we would do the waveguide formation and the contacts, and then we would have to break the wafer to do the manufacturing of the facets, the coating, and then we'd have to test each one individually. It's a lot of steps of the process. If we can etch the facets on the wafer scale, it allows us to do the formation, the contacts, the facets and the facets coating all at wafer scale. We can then um, test it on the wafer scale itself. So we know which devices are good and which ones are poor before we uh, cleave and package the final devices. So as you can see, this research can have quite a large impact on uh, several areas of the industry moving forward. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much, Tristan. That was a fantastic talk. Um, so with the questions, we've got time for two or three questions. And just anyone who wants to speak, raise your hand, introduce yourself, and then we'll come and bring a mic over. So I think uh, just over there, Alex. A fantastic talk. Really, really good. I enjoyed that. <laughs> uh, my, my name is Graham Berry. I'm from Huawei. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually make India phosphide lasers. So finding you're working on etch facets and, and that sort of technology is really 
you know, is really interesting. Uh, bonding to silicon carbide might be interesting to look at as well. So mm -hmm. your indium phosphide layer sitting on some silicon carbide mm -hmm. would be an interesting thing to put into the project. Yeah. So when you would do the F there, you're effectively bringing in more materials, which is going to affect the plasma chemistry even yeah. more. To begin with, we're trying to keep it as simple as we can, <laughs> but that's definitely somewhere to go in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, just over here, please. My name is Ahmed from uh, CDT Cohort 3. Uh, nice to meet you, by the way. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, question about the uh, mask you used for, the, uh, uh, for your process. Uh, what material was it? And did you struggle in finding an appropriate material that does not react with the gases you were using? So this one uses a silicon oxide mask, you know, last test. Um, the wisdom is essentially when you're etching indium phosphide is to decide between silicon nitride and silicon oxides. Typically, the decision comes down to whether or not you're already using a nitride in your process. If not, I think it's more or less up to you. I don't think it makes all that much of a difference between the two different mask types. Um, again, if we run into any issues, that's something we can certainly look into changing the mask materials. I know we were uh, recommended to stay away from metal masks. So, uh, cause that can transfer roughnesses down onto the sidewalls. Apart from that, I don't think there's too much of an impact between silicon oxide and silicon nitride. All right, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm, I'm Kate. I'm also in CDT cohort three. Um, my question was about the carrier wafer in your phosphide interface. Was there a, some sort of bonding agent there already, or is it just, I'm guessing you're using a chuck to mm -hmm. keep it in place? So at the moment, it's just the coupon placed on the carrier. There's nothing bonding it or anything like that. So um, there is some uh, work being done, and they find that when you add in materials to bond the coupon to the wafer, it can interact with the plasma, which then working on coupons, you can get some quite high quality results. But when you're trying to scale up to wafer sizes, you're effectively starting again. So we want to try and make that process, um, that recipe transfer as simple as possible. Um, I think we have one more question, actually, while we're still on good time. Uh, just you and down at the front. <laughs> Sorry, are we going to bring you a microphone um, just so that the people on Zoom can hear as well? Hi, yeah, uh, as you and Davis from IQE. Mm -hmm. um, so, in an ideal world, Kristen, um, mm -hmm. I understand the the issues regarding the, the the differences between a coupon sitting on on a wafer and maybe not getting that ideal thermal contact. So, in an ideal world, to and looking at, I was fascinated by your slider diagram. It struck me, and I'm being a, a layman in processing at least. Uh, I'm more of an epi taxi guy. Um, would you would you would use something like a design of experiments, and therefore require quite a lot of material? And in an ideal world, would you rather have lots and lots of Indian phosphate wafers to play with? I, I, I yeah, ideally we'd like to have as many Indian phosphate wafers because that would just make the transfer even easier. And, and does, do they need to be? Who are Indian phosphate, or can they be Indian phosphate with some epitaxy on them? Or? So our first tests were done with uh, iron doped Indian phosphate substrates. No, just uh, no substrates. Yeah. yeah, just to try and home the process before we start using really expensive material. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely we want to try and extend this to active material growth on top and etch through that as well. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tristan. Thank you. So our next presentation is going to be from uh, Kobe Maynard. Um, Kobe is sponsored by Newport Wafer Fab and his PhD supervisor, Daryl Beggs. Um, Kobe's telling us about uh, compound semiconductor, integrated photonics, the manufacturing and characterization of these devices. So. Kirby. Cheers, Tom. Thank you much. Uh, hi there, I'm Kirby, and today I'm going to be talking to you, as Tom said, about compound semiconductor integrated photonics manufacturing characterization. Bit of a mouthful. Um, so I'm at Cardiff Uni. My supervisors are Daryl Beggs, Anthony Bennett, and Michael Whale. 
and my project is part of lab. So to begin with, the organizers have asked us to discuss um, the impacts of our research and or envisage the impact of our PhD projects to be. Uh, and for me, um, the impact that I want is for to be using nitride as a material for integrated photonics. Um, so these are the uh, main building for sonic integrated circuits. Um, these are all made out of silicon, but I see no reason uh, these can't all be made out of gallium nitride. So my work on my PhD is really to be um, kind of demonstrating uh, these devices in gallium nitride um, to kind of try and convince people uh, to use it because in many ways it's a better material than silicon. Uh, so today I'll talk about quantum computing and the problem with silicon photonics. Then I'll move on to why I've chosen gallium nitride. And then I'll talk about my work in um, angle etching and triangle waveguides. So the motivation behind my project is in uh, photonic quantum computing. So I'll just give you, um, well, I'll just talk through this uh, very simple schematic of a photonic quantum computer. So you start with your uh, single photon sources that produce your light, which is then injected into your switching network. Uh, and the light in the network is um, guided around the circuit via the waveguides, these lines here. And then your switching network is made of, of um, phase shifters and beam splitters. And these uh, change the path or change the direction uh, of the light and perform the calculations. And then once the uh, light has been processed um, by the switching network, light is then coupled out of the circuit into your single photon stators. And currently, um, silicon photonics has been used to make these devices, um, which makes a lot of sense because it's a very good passive material, a high index contrast with oxide. Uh, it's also transparent at wavelengths of 50 and 50 nanometers. That's really important for telecommunications purposes. And uh, silicon waveguides typically have low losses. They're generally less than two decibels per centimeter. But the reason that people use silicon is because it's cheap and easy, um, or relatively cheap and easy. Um, so it's very manufacturable, it's very easy to work with, um, and, the, and it's a very mature um, industry. However, if we were to start from scratch and choose the material, we probably wouldn't choose silicon um, because it's a very poor active material. So it, uh, it's got an indirect band gap, so it's an inefficient emitter and absorber of light. Uh, and this is really important for on-chip um, sources and detectors. And although its band gap is um, large enough, so that one photon, 1550, is absorbed, um, two photons at the same time are, and this loss is called two photon absorption. Um, and crucially for our purposes, uh, it's really important for these um, switches here, is silicon doesn't have a chi 2 electron uh, effect. So that means that its refractive index doesn't change with an applied electric field. And this is really important for these switches. However, we'll hope it's not lost. Thankfully, there are all sensors out there. And the um, material that I'm looking at in my PhD is gallium nitride. Gallium nitride has a large refractive index, so it can provide a high optical confinement. Its band gap is also sufficiently large so that it doesn't suffer from two photon absorption, 15 and 15 nanometers. And its band gap is also direct, so it is an efficient uh, emitter and absorber. And crucially for us, it does have an appreciable pocket electric optic effect, so you can make um, fast, efficient electric optic switches from it. However, the uh, disadvantages that gallium, gallium nitride has at the moment is manufacturability. It's seen as not very manufacturable uh, material to work with. Uh, it's quite expensive um, to work on as well. Uh, and that's kind of one of the things that's holding uh, gallium nitride back in its greater photonics. Um, and that is uh, partly linked to um, the fact that it's grown on sapphire substrates. So although the sapphire um, gives us an index contrast for optical confinement, it does also um, have a lattice mismatch, which introduces strain and dislocations at the uh, epitaxial interface. So now moving on to uh, my work. So this is the part um, where I'm going to talk about how I'm making gallium nitride uh, more manufacturable to make it more attractive for integrated photonics. So angled etching or Faraday cage assisted uh, ICP etching is a manufacturing um, technique that allows you to etch and undercut in one step. So in, an, in an angled etching, sorry, uh, you place your sample within this Faraday cage here, um, which has a, a triangular cross section. So it's a triangular prism shape. Uh, and uh, so this is all within the etch chamber and the Faraday cage deflects the ions in the etch chamber. So that so that the uh, trajectory is perpendicular to the cage surface. And that results in this characteristic um, angled etching profile. Uh, and then once you've removed the residual etch mask and etched fully, you're left with these uh, suspended nano beams with triangular cross section. But the question is, once you've made these triangular nano beams, um, what are the optical properties? You need to know um, what you're working with really, and what you, what you can make with them. Um, so 
to investigate this, I simulated a range of equilateral triangle uh, waveguides with widths ranging from 4,000 nanometers uh, with the results seen here. So on the left, uh, the left hand side, uh, I plotted the effective index for the um, four modes that were supported this width regime. And on the right hand side, I've got the electric field profiles um, for the transverse electric transverse magnetic modes as a function of width. And uh, what you can see um, on this graph, you might be able to tell from this graph is that um, as the waveguide width increases, uh, unsurprisingly, the um, waveguide is more able to support the optical mode and um, the evanescent field here um, extends um, kind of, well, extends less into the background um, and uh, is more and more contained by the waveguide. Um, and then when you just get to 650 nanometers, um, you see this nice um, singular antinode in the center um, and you have hyper confinement. Um, so there's an interesting result as, as well in here. So you might not be able to see it at the back, but the T and TM modes are actually plotted on top of each other. Um, so for equilateral triangle waveguides, the T and TM modes have um, approximately equal effective indices. So they are approximately degenerate, three decimal places. Um, and this is quite an interesting result because we normally wouldn't expect um, a triangular cross section, um, which is not 90 degree symmetric to have um, uh, you know, identical or nearly identical effective indices for these two orthogonal modes. You know, if, when you rotate your uh, triangle, triangular cross section by 90 degrees, the mode would see um, a different um, kind of shape and uh, that should have an impact, impact on the effective indices, but you can see here it doesn't. And so just to note, these results have been uh, shown in the literature before, um, so we do believe them. However, um, nobody's really come up with a solution as to why or an explanation. So if anybody's got any ideas, uh, let me know during the break. Um, uh, so once you made these waveguides, in reality, it's very unlikely, um, unfortunately, that they'll be perfectly equilateral or perfectly symmetric. Um, and this can obviously have an impact on your optical properties. So to investigate this, I simulated a range of uh, isosceles triangles, results on the left, and scaling triangles on the right, um, uh, and saw what effect this had on the optical mode. So on the left-hand side, you've got the isosceles triangles. Um, because in reality, um, when, you, when you're in the etch chamber, the ions don't have a perfectly um, 30 degree um, etch angle. They have a wide range of angles. Um, so it's possible that you may not get the exact angle that you're looking for. Um, so these results were kind of trying to simulate that. Uh, so I simulated um, triangles with the upper angle theta varying between 30 degrees. So short and stubby uh, waveguides going to 80, so long and thin. Um, and what we found was that uh, for the equilateral triangle cross sections, again, we have um, this degeneracy here, the T and TM modes. And then as the uh, waveguide cross section uh, diverges away from this equilateral case, um, the uh, uh, modes also diverge and the waveguide becomes birefringent. And this is also um, seen in the scaling triangles. So as the um, bottom vertex here moves all the way to the left and all the way, all the, way to the right of the waveguide, um, the birefringence increases. Cool. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, so to summarize, I've talked about the angled etching of gallium nitride and the triangular waveguides that it produces. Um, and I've described the degeneracy of the T and TM modes for the triangular waveguides. And um, I briefly talked about the impact that I hope to have for the PhD, which is um, the more people use gallium nitride as an integrated photonics platform. Cheers. Toby, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. We've got time for a couple of questions. Um, so I'd like to open the floor. Come on, someone must have one. Go ahead. Hello, again. Um, <laughs> so obviously with the um, VPs aim being uh, manufacturability and scalability, is, is this a technique that could be used on multiple wafer uh, or large uh, wafer areas or to make multiple active features at once? Or? Uh, yeah, so in terms of the scale, um, you're really kind of limited by the size of the um, edge chamber. So as long as you can make a cage which is big enough then to fit in the edge chamber, then you can make any size you want. Um, but obviously citation leaders, we haven't done that yet. So that's what we expect to happen. Um, and in terms of making um, multiple devices kind of at the same time, um, we're, that's currently what we're doing. So um, we're 
currently trying to figure out what happens when you make bends. Um, but I think once we've got that sorted and we know that that works fine, uh, then we should be okay. Um, just over here, please. Hi, I'm Alex from Cohort 3 as well. Um, how closely can you pack these waveguides together? Um, yeah, so it's a very good question. Um, so another simulation I ran, which isn't shown there, was um, for the to see what impact the kind of substrate uh, foot has on the. You can there is this kind of triangular section here. Um, found was that there's a separation. Well, so uh, the waveguides that I simulated were around 750 nanometers wide, um, so about 660 um, nanometers thick, and you needed a separation of around 650 nanometers away from the substrate um, before the mode is. Uh, the same as an isolate mode, really. So around about a waveguide um, in terms of height. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Graham. What sort of losses do you think you need to get down to for it to become a viable technology? You know, when you're competing against silicon nitride and other materials that have quite high chi twos. Yeah, um, so in terms of efficient, uh, do you mean losses in terms of like the propagation losses? Yeah, or, propagation losses. Um, yeah, so ideally we'd like to be around two decibels per centimeter, uh, but um, we'll see. Alex, just over here. Okay, I'm Tony, cohort three again. Um, relates to the losses question, actually, because um, I think most people know gallium nitride, it's difficult to make it without defects dislocations. Um, have you modeled any of that into your modeling? Um, the kind of quality you need to, to make these things work? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, but so what we're hoping with the angled etching uh, technique is that um, because you're just using the, the top uh, regions of the material, that's hopefully where there are fewer uh, dislocations. But again, we'll see. Um, but yeah, my, my kind of aim is to just make these devices and then, uh, you know, if it does turn out there are some issues, then next year's cohort can sort this out and get some more papers. <laughs> okay, I've got a quick one yeah. for you actually. So when you're looking, obviously, so say in an ideal world, you fabricate these, you've got some great gallium nitrides that you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of characterization techniques are you gonna to use to analyze, say, whether the modes are properly confined um, is there any techniques that you've got in mind? Uh, not so much for whether the modes are confined, um, because I suppose we're uh, relying on the simulations there. Um, but I suppose what we find is that if the modes weren't confined, then our losses would be pretty terrible. Um, and we have to go to the drawing board. But um, you're not really. So the characterization that we're running at the moment um, is uh, calculating the propagation losses. Um, so we've got the using the cutback method. Um, I'm going to kind of just go from there. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kobe. Um, so for the final talk of this session, we have Paradisa. Paradisa is working with um, Leonardo. She's developing long wavelength infrared detectors based on uh, antimonide materials, and she's um, supervised by Manoj. Paradisa. Okay. Um, hello? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, so I'm working on type 2 superlattices with a focus on long wavelength infrared detectors. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to go over uh, the impact of these, uh, so some of their uses. Um, the current state of the art and why we would want to use type 2 superlattices, as well as some of my own research, um, which is in modeling these type 2 superlattices. So we all know from thermodynamics um, that all bodies above absolute zero emit infrared radiation. Um, however, the infrared region lies just beyond the visible region. Uh, therefore necessitating the use of detectors to gain access to the information. The long wavelength infrared region in particular lies between eight to 12 micron, 
um, with room temperature being uh, exactly in the middle of that at 10 micrometers. Uh, this is quite important as it can tell us a lot about our surroundings as well as the human body and therefore it has applications in fields such as astronomy, um, defense purposes, as well as medicine. In uh, most recent years, um, during the pandemic in particular, infrared detectors could be used to check people's temperatures with a high temperature indicating that they had COVID. Um, so yeah, they're quite useful. Um, the current state of the art um, are mercury cadmium telluride uh, infrared detectors, also known as MCT. However, they do have some issues. Uh, namely, they are notoriously hard to fabricate as very small changes in composition can cause very large changes in the cutoff wavelength of the detectors. They also have a very expensive substrate, which they're grown on. Um, as well as mercury being on the list of restrictions of hazardous substances, and therefore um, it's trying to be phased out by the EU. Um, one of the alternatives, um, which is very promising, are type two super lattices. Um, yeah, so here you can see um, a, a, stru a structure for type two super lattice. Um, the, they, the reason that they are um, being considered to replace mercury cadmium telluride is that they suppress Auger recombination. Um, they, have, they are easier and cheaper to fabricate due to the already existing um, 3.5 semiconductor industry. Um, and they also offer just as good um, band structure engineering as um, mercury cadmium telluride. Um, so what are type two super lattices? Um, well, they're periodic structures with alternating uh, layers of semiconductor compounds. Um, they confine um, the electrons and holes in different um, layers. So as you can see, um, the, wa the waves there, they're the wave functions um, for the uh, electrons and holes. Um, so yeah, you can see that the electrons are confined to the indium arsenic and the, uh, sorry. Yeah, electrons are confined to um, the indium arsenic layer and the holes are confined to the gallium and timony layer. Um, Due to the periodic nature of uh, these um, structures, um, they, um, they form electron and hole mini bands, uh, which are the equivalent of the conduction and valence bands in the bulk materials. Um, however, they have much smaller um, um, they have much smaller um, band gaps energies um, than the bulk materials um, and they band gap can be tuned um, by changing the either the period thickness or the thickness of individual layers um, so either indium arsenic or gallium antimony um, Changing the size of the layers or of the band gap will, of course, affect um, their properties uh, as well as the band gap, um, and therefore modeling them is quite useful. Um, and that's what I have been looking at during my first year. Um, so modeling, uh, so I've been modeling uh, using Next Nano, which is a commercially available software. Um, commonly used in industry, as well as for scientific papers and doctoral theses. Um, I've implemented the eight band K.P method. And uh, in this first image, you can see a typical indium arsenic gallium antimony structure. Uh, it has 14 monolayers of indium arsenic and seven monolayers of gallium antimony. And I've included uh, in 
indium antimony interfacial layer, um, which is 10% of the indium arsenic, and this is for strain compensation. Um, in the um, of their graph, you can see the band structure for this um, super lattice, um, as well as its uh, band gap, which was 121 milli electron volts, um, or 10.3 micron, um, which um, is um, similar to uh, known detectors. Um, so modeling these um, type two super lattices means that we can effectively design long wavelength infrared detectors targeting the exact uh, the exact wavelength that we would like. So here I've looked at um, the band gap um, as a function of the band gap as a function of electron effective mass. Um, and this is just one of the outputs that uh, Next Nano can give. It can also give the wave function overlap, absorption coefficients, and a lot more, which is why it's so useful and uh, used so widely. Um, the, as you can see um, here, uh, this is the long wavelength infrared region. So it's between um, about 100 uh, milli electron volts to 155 milli electron volts. And these structures in particular can give us um, the cutoff wavelength that we would like. Um, for as you decrease the structure size, um, the wave function overlap will increase, and therefore that increases um, the absorption of the material um, and also quantum efficiencies. So it's quite useful to go to a smaller scale. Um, as I mentioned, one of the most commonly used um, super lattices is the 14.7 structure. Uh, this one in particular is 14.6. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it gives a, um, a band gap of 121 milli electron volts. Um, However, we can obtain the same or similar band gap um, with another structure, um, which is the 12 monolayer of indium arsenic, four monolayers of gallium antimony structure. Um, and my group has looked at this uh, structure and has published a few papers on it. Um, yeah, um, so... Uh, to conclude, um, type 2 superlattices are theoretically um, predicted to outperform mercury cadmium telluride. Um, I have shown that we can model these um, structures in order to optimize the device performance, as well as to target specific um, wave um, wavelengths. Um, and lastly, um, uh, we've looked at another structure that can be used um, in place of um, the 14.7 type 2 super lattice. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, my supervisory team, uh, Diana Huffaker, um, Chris Maxey, who's my industrial um, co-supervisor, Peter Hargrave, um, as well as um, my group members, um, Dominic Kwan, Dafer Al Shahrani and Ezekiel, and of course my supervisor Manoj, um, as well as my funding bodies, uh, ESPRC, uh, Leonardo, um, and Next Nano for providing the um, modeling software. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much, Paradis. So that was a fantastic talk. Um, do we have any questions from the audience at all? Uh, Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Ang from Cohort 3. 
My question is, when it comes to implement, uh, to uh, realize the implement for the similar um, IR range spectrum, yep. um, which stack would you, uh, like which structure is the preference to choose? Like uh, uh, there's a former slide shows the different stacks. Yeah, yeah. Um, this one. Yeah, when, when it comes to like um, the, si the similar range, which structure will you to choose or any elements for you to make a choice? Yeah, of course, um, there's a lot to consider. Um, there are a lot of different factors uh, when it comes to type two super lattices, um, one of which is the electron effective mass. Um, when, when you decrease um, the electron effective mass, um, you can increase, uh, you can also decrease the band to band tunneling um, so it's quite useful to for that. Um, there is, as I mentioned, Nextano has uh, a lot of other capabilities, such as showing the absorption coefficients, um, which I've not shown here. Um, but I, it, you can see the output um, from that, um, and therefore, you know, pick the structure that will give you the best absorption. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of other considerations. Um, you also want to um, uh, optimize the, de the design of the actual PIN structure that you're going to grow, um, which uh, can be done in other software. Um, we're currently using Solvaco to do that. Um, that's something I'm looking into at the moment. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, thank you. Thanks. Uh, fantastic. Any more questions? Hi there. Um, with the longer wavelength stuff that you're doing, I imagine um, you probably need thicker materials to mm -hmm. give it a chance of absorbing more. What kind of thicknesses are you using for these devices? Um, so most of what I've seen in the literature is usually around 300 periods. Um, sorry, um, the, con the convention for this uh, particular subject is to, to measure it in monolayers and then period thicknesses. <laughs> um, so uh, I can't actually remember the equivalent um, thickness. <laughs> uh, sorry, I can, I can look that up and okay. get back to you. <laughs> Um, okay, I've got a quick question for you. So at the moment we've looked at just the gallium antimonide materials. Um, are there any alternative materials that you could look at? Because I know the gallium antimonide is not the easiest thing to grow and substrate wise can be a bit challenging as well. Yeah, of course. Um, there are also gallium free uh, types of lattices, which have other advantages, but also some disadvantages. Um, and they have been looked into for uh, mid wavelength purposes in particular a lot, um, and they may be applicable for uh, long wavelength. However, currently it still seems that the gallium containing are the best at the moment for this particular wavelength region. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, are there any more questions at all? We've got time for maybe one more. Callum. Thank you for coming all this way, Alex. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Callum, cohort two. Uh, I, I may have missed this, forgive me if there's a repeated question of what you've covered, but uh, you know, monolayers, as I understand it, quite, um, quite fine periods. Yeah. So, 12 what, four, yeah. Yeah, what, what methods uh, are you aiming to achieve? fabricating this in later stages? Um, so MBE is used um, in order to fabricate them. I'm not actually on the fabrication side of things. Um, maybe Rich can tell you a bit more about that. <laughs> um, I'm sure he'll have a great talk on it next year. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Excellent, thank you so much Paradisa. That was great. So we're going to be heading into a short break now, um, about 20 minutes, um, after which we'll come back and we'll have another set of talks from the um, cohorts. 
so yeah guys thank you very much feel free to get up wander around um and thank you so much for coming that looks about right isn't it yeah okay cool right so those just joining my name's callum i'm from the cohort two uh, so i'll be chairing this session um got quite a time, tight time slot so without further ado uh, we have uh, rachel clark who is uh, from cardiff university doing efficient quantum light sources uh, her supervisor is professor anthony bennett and um you've got your mpl that's the one right <laughs> thank you very much Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Callum, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about characterizing quantum light sources and specifically the impacts of quantum light metrology. So I wanted to start with this figure to show the wide range of different disciplines that um, quantum light sources are able to impact. And um, probably one of the most notable, important um, in terms of the, its potential impact on society and, and the economy um, is this top right hand corner. Um, quantum information processing and specifically quantum computing and cryptography. These are two areas that are experiencing a lot of R&D funding at the moment, and they're in this period of quite rapid growth. So how can we harness this impact um, here in the UK? If we want to improve our understanding of quantum emitters and detectors in these kind of early stages of developing quantum computing, um, it's really important that we start thinking about how to develop the metrology and establishing a quantum national standard for these types of light sources. Um, and some of the considerations that we need to make when we're thinking about this is, firstly, what specific parameters of any kind of system is it that we need to measure in order to be able to extract meaningful information about um, the system performance? Secondly, when we're making these measurements, how can we ensure that they're taken and analyzed as efficiently and precisely as possible? Um, how close are they to the true value of the system? And is there any kind of calibration um, that we might need to make? And then finally, are these specific parameters consistently measurable across different physical systems? And it's this third point that is really the focus of what I'm trying to do with quantum light sources. So where might we find quantum light emitters? Um, these are just a few different examples of where you can find quantum light sources. So firstly, uh, we have color centers. These are a specific type of crystal defect that is typically found um, in materials like diamond or 3-5 semiconductors. Um, and effectively, the crystal defect introduces an energy level that wouldn't be present otherwise. And these energy level transitions have been shown to emit quantum light. Um, secondly, we have quantum dots in micro resonator structures. So quantum dots are a really popular um, light source because their emission wavelength is tunable depending on their size. Um, and they're typically found in these micro resonator structures um, to enhance their emission. So on the left, um, this is an embedded quantum dot layer in a micro pillar cavity that was processed by my group here in Cardiff. Um, and on the right is just a couple of cartoons showing um, a bullseye resonator on the top and a photonic crystal cavity on the bottom. Um, and finally, another example is um, 2D materials. So things like tungsten diselenide or hexagonal boron nitride, um, the, the monolayers of these materials have band gaps that are different to the bulk material. Um, and these monolayers have been shown to emit quantum light. So once we've found the quantum light, how can we characterize it? And specifically, um, what is it that tells us that a light source is giving us quantum light rather than any other type of light? So there are basically three different signatures um, when it comes to light behavior, and these are all related to the average photon spacing in the light beam. So firstly, we have bunched light. So if we consider how the light from this source might arrive at a detector, um, it arrives in bunches. So you're more likely to find multiple photons arriving all at once. Um, and at the detector, this, this basically looks like a kind of on-off blinking effect. Um, secondly, we have coherent light. Um, and coherent light sources have completely random arrivals at a detector. So each arrival is completely independent of the others. And then finally, we have anti-bunch light. 
obviously, as the name implies, this is basically the opposite to bunch. You're less likely to find photons together. You're more likely to find photons on their own or single photons. And it's this that defines our quantum light regime. Um, so we decide which kind of behavior that our light is exhibiting with this experiment. This is a really old and famous experiment called the Henry Brown Twist experiment. And basically you have your source coming in on the top left here. Um, it hits a beam splitter and then it's split into two correlated beams of light, which are then both incident on independent detectors. And what we're trying to find when we do this experiment is what is the distribution of differences in arrival times between detector one and detector two? And the distribution looks like this. So this is the second order correlation function. Uh, it's more commonly called a G2. Um, you can see from the mathematical description at the bottom that, um, that it's giving us an idea of the time average um, intensity fluctuations of each beam. And clearly the intensity is related to the number of photons. Um, and the figure basically shows us um, how it, it, it demonstrates the likelihood of photon arrivals happening at a particular time. So the point at which tau equals zero is um, equivalent to a simultaneous coincidence. So a photon arriving at detector one and detector two at the same time. And we can see that um, for the three signatures of light that I explained, um, their G2 looks different, and that's because they all have different likelihoods of having coincidences. So the coherent G2 is completely flat for all tau, and that's because every event is independent, so you're no more or less likely to find photons arriving at any one time. The bunched light, as I said earlier, you're more expected to find the photons arriving together, so you're more, also more likely to get coincidences at both detectors. Um, and then conversely, for the anti-bunched light, because you're more likely to get single photons, when it hits your beam splitter, it's either going to go to detector one or detector two. You're, for a perfect source, you're never going to see a coincidence. And that's why you see the G2 for the anti bunch light dip at zero. So typically this experiment is um, done using a configuration called start-stop. Um, and this means that you choose one of your detection channels to be a start channel so that when a photon is incident, a timer begins. Um, and then the other detection channel would be stop. And this is a really quick and easy way to find um, the shortest time differences between your photon arrivals. However, another kind of configuration is one that uses something called timestamps measurements. Um, these are basically a list of every single photon arrival on every detection channel. And these are kind of useful for generating the G2 function because firstly, you have information on every single detection detection event. Um, so it's not just the nearest neighbor um, measurement that you get with start stop. Secondly, using timestamp measurements can help you to avoid really common photo detection issues. So things like pile up, which can um, skew your G2 function. Um, and finally, if we're able to implement a code that is able to read in lists of timestamp measurements and generate a correlation function for two detection channels, it's theoretically a lot easier to scale this up to more detection channels. So can we scale this up to a G to the N function, get a G3 or a G4? And this was the reason that I started looking at time step measurements was to try and find higher order correlations. Um, so here are a few examples of um, G2s that I've processed using um, a time stamping code. So on the left, this is an anti-bunch source. So you can see the characteristic dip at time zero. Um, and on the right, this is a bunched source. So you can see the characteristic peak at time zero. And once we had kind of verified that the code was able to read in the time step measurements and kind of faithfully produce a G2 function, we wanted to start thinking about, can we do higher order correlations? And to do that, you need to extend the Hanbury Brown Swiss setup to have more detection channels. So you can just do this by effectively adding in more beam splitters and more detectors. And I was measuring bunched light. And the way we did this was by scattering laser light off of a rough spinning mirror. Um, this is a really good approximation to a bunched light beam because it's able to mimic the on off behavior that you see um, because it's, it has the same kind of intensity fluctuations. So what are the challenges involved in measuring higher order correlations? 
So one of the first things you have to consider when you're trying to calculate an, a, a correlation function um, is making sure that you have enough counts on your histogram. Um, and the quickest way to do this is to increase the channel rates. Um, so, so to show you um, how quickly this happens, um, these are three graphs showing um, the counts per bin in a histogram against the channel rate for a G2, a G3, and a G4 under typical experimental conditions. So length of 10 minutes and things like that. And basically what you can see on this is that um, the counts depend on the channel rate, but it also depends quite strongly on the order. So on the axes, this axis here goes up to about 3 million, um, but for a G4, it only goes up to about 80 counts. So you have to increase your channel rates much more rapidly to be able to get, it's, it's a lot harder to populate your G4 histogram basically. Um, but not only that, um, the higher orders require higher count rates, but obviously as well, every time you introduce a higher order, you have, you're, you're introducing a new detection channel that you need to read and search. Um, and also as well, higher rates means that you have bigger files, means that you have longer execution times for your code. Um, so, and I found approximately that with my code, the execution time roughly depends on the file size to the power of the order. Um, this is a really long time. Um, so just to give you a, a rough idea with numbers, um, if I have an incident photon rate of about 500,000 counts, um, I can calculate a G2 in 50 minutes. It takes me six hours to calculate a G3. It would take me about 41 hours to calculate a G4. So we're going from minutes to hours to days um, when we're scaling up um, the order of these correlations. Um, and to finish, um, I wanted to show you a G3. So, um, so this is basically the same data set. On the left here, um, we're looking at double coincidences between channel one and channel two. And on the right, we're looking at triple coincidences between channel one, two, and three. Um, and basically what this is showing you is that you are six times more likely to have photons arriving at detector one and two and three simultaneously than you are to have them arriving all at three completely different times. So that would be out in these corners here. Um, and as I mentioned, I've been using bunch light to, to take these measurements. But what we really want to do now that I can measure G3s is um, measure a quantum light source because um, the G3 basically just contains a lot more information about the statistical fluctuations of the light field. And if we're looking at a source that we don't necessarily understand, like the, the lifetimes of the emission and things like that, the G3 might be able to reveal some interesting features about the cross correlations, things like time asymmetries um, that might not necessarily be apparent without having access to this measurement. So um, to conclude, um, I've showed you how the metrology of quantum light sources is really important. Um, and the standardization of measurement is essential in the early stages of quantum computing. Um, and finally, higher order correlations with timestamp measurements are really computationally challenging, um, but might be able to offer us like, novel insights that we wouldn't otherwise have. Um, thank you to my sponsors and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Rachel. Really interesting talk. Um, I'm afraid in the interest of time, we only have time for one question. We have one in the room. We have one in the middle. The usual suspect. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering if you, when it comes to the measurement side of things, if, if stray light poses a real challenge or if it's... Sorry, I can't remember. Sorry, if, when it comes to the measurement side of things, does stray light pose a challenge for the detectors in terms of your uh, simulation, your measurements, or is it all just what? Stray light, as in stray light coming into the detectors. Oh, right. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So you have to perform these in like a dark room. Um, yeah, but background light is a, is a problem. Most of my experiment is all in fiber, though. Um, so as long as you're doing it um, in a dark room, it is fine. But yeah, you, and it depends on what detector you're using. So we have a few different detectors. I use like the really high resolution detectors for these measurements. Um, but it is also with the timestamp measurements, the, the good thing about those is it's really easy to correct for those kind of things, because you could just take like a background measurement and then subtract that from all of your counts. Um, so it is something that you have to consider, but not necessarily any more than any other optical experiment. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Okay, next up we have uh, Tom Murphy, also Cardiff University. Uh, his interests are dilute nitrides and alternative pixel sources for 1300 nanometers. He's under supervision of uh, Peter Smoten, Professor Peter Smoten, and his industrial sponsor is IQE. Take away, Tom. Hi, everyone. Um, hello again. So today I'm going to be talking about dilute nitrides for 1300 nanometer, well, greater than 1300 nanometer VIXL applications. But before I get into the material side of things, it's useful to discuss what you actually use long wavelength, long wavelength lasers for. So long wavelength lasers are typically used for things like optical communication, so data communication in data centers, long haul fiber, and things like that. We also have options for 3D sensing and LIDAR. More recent developments, we've looked at beneath OLED LED, um, lasers for facial recognition in mobile phones. That would be to look at placing the laser sensors underneath the screen, operating at a wavelength that the OLED screen is transparent. And that means you could remove things like the notch on iPhones, make it you know, more attractive and get more screen real estate. And then typically gas sensors are a generic application for most laser devices anyway, because you can look at the different absorption of CO2, for example. The question we have now is why VIXELs? At the moment, we've got some great technologies in edge emitting lasers um, operating in the 1300 to 1550 nanometer range. The issue of edge emitting lasers is that they are quite complex in practice to fabricate. You generally use multiple epitaxy stages. You have cleaves or facet etches, as we've discussed today, potentially you know, regrowths to produce DBRs. Whereas with VIXELs, the... Um, laser structure is contained within the actual epitaxy of the wafer. So you don't need to perform such complex fabrication. Vixels actually at the moment, we're developing a technique where you can produce Vixels the turnaround of a few days, as opposed to maybe a couple of weeks for an edge emitting laser. Edge emitting lasers emit from the edge of the device, um, which also creates issues when you're looking at 3D sensing, you have to use optics to project the beam upwards out of the device, whereas with VIXELs, they emit from the top of the laser structure, which makes it a lot easier to integrate into 3D sensing modules, for example, when you're looking at a mobile phone. Typically, the edge emitting lasers for long wavelength applications are made from indium phosphide. Indium phosphide is quite a challenging material to work with. One of the main reasons that we don't produce indium phosphide VIXELs, for example, is the issue of strain and lattice matching because as you can see from this graph, there are not many compounds that are lattice matched easily with indium phosphide, at least with ternary compounds. Whereas for gallium arsenide, there are a multitude of aluminium containing compounds which can be lattice matched relatively simply. The issue with gallium arsenide is that at present, it's quite challenging to produce long wavelength devices just because of the band gap of the gallium arsenide based alloys. There's been some work done using ingas, but that's unfortunately hampered by strain issues. The material that I'm looking to research is dilute nitrides. So dilute nitrides are gallium arsenide based materials that have an incorporation of about less than 10% nitrogen into the bimolar fraction. And what that leads to, as you can see in this figure, is this quite sharp reduction in band gap, which enables us to access some longer wavelength ranges and also a very small change in lattice constant for such a big reduction. So you can, by alloying with, say, some indium or something else like that, you can end up producing approximately lattice matched long wavelength lasers, which are compatible with the gallium arsenide material system, opening up the range of lattice matched aluminium containing alloys to produce your mirrors for your laser. With dilute nitrides, you have materials and in increasing complexity, you start with a ternary where you're just adding a small amount of nitrogen. That's the most basic one. And that's been grown quite a few times via MBE. You have quaternaries where you're alloying indium, and this can give you options to further reduce the band gap and also start to do some strain management to enable lattice matching and a quinary material system where you add small amounts of antimony. And using these materials, we have been able to access at least with bulk materials, band gaps that correspond to wavelength ranges from 850 to 1550 nanometers. So covering the entire spectrum of gallium arsenide, short wavelength detect, short wavelength emitters, all the way up to the equivalent indium phosphide for data communication and such. 
My work at the moment has been on modeling these dilute nitrides. The early models are, the early models known as the band anti-crossing model, and it considers the incorporation of nitrogen at 10, less than 10% to act like a defect state. These defect centers essentially reside below the band gap of the gallium arsenide host material that perturbs it. And we get this splitting into a positive and a negative, but a higher and a lower energy band. We rarely see emission in the literature from the E plus band. So for all intents and purposes, we can ignore it and act like it's not there and focus solely on the E minus band, which is what we consider to be optically active. Um, the incorporation of nitrogen in this model is quite consistent with what we see in with grown material that we get a reduction in band gap. But for my applications, this doesn't really incorporate doesn't really tell us the full story. So I've been working on using k.p method instead. The k.p method is essentially a method in which method which um, looks at how the Schrodinger equation is perturbed by a defect, well, material when modeling it as a periodic crystal. We incorporate the nitrogen states and an interaction term, VNC, which describes how the nitrogen state interacts with the conduction band. And we explicitly define all the other, whole, all the other um, bands, such as the heavy hole, light hole, and split off. Um, when you take this Hamiltonian and put the right numbers in, the eigenvalues of this give you energy dispersion relations, or what we like to call EK plots and it's value, valid for small values of um, K. The results so far have been quite interesting. So you can see from the top of both of these figures that we're getting the same anti-crossing effect as we get from the band anti-crossing model. You get this reduction in band gap and you get a second band forming for the E plus. When we are alloying, this is not considering strain at the moment in, this, in these plots, this is just looking at bulk yeah, theoretical isolated bulk dilute nitride material. When you incorporate 1% nitrogen, you get a band gap reduction of down to 1.25 EV. And when you incorporate 5% nitrogen, you're reducing your band gap even further to about 0.9 EV. The model has been further developed by incorporating indium. And when we look at strain, we can see that we're starting to get this perturbation of the heavy hole and light hole bands. It's like splitting. We're looking at the mismatch and how essentially by incorporating both indium and nitrogen you can get the simultaneous reduction in band gap and balance the strain the uh, graph on the right hand side is showing how when we match up the indium composition to the nitrogen such that the difference in lattice constant is approximately zero we get a lattice match alloy so this model is predictive and it can tell us which comp compositions of indium we can use for a given composition of nitrogen and we can get wavelengths down to about 1600 while still remaining lattice matched well approximately lattice matched with compositions of indium and nitrogen a bit of further work that we're doing at the moment so my current work is looking at alloying with antimony antimony is a really interesting material for dilute nitrides because essentially what it does it acts as a surfactant so with dilute nitrides which are indium containing we see that you get essentially clustering of indium as you grow the material. And the antimony seems to spread this out and separate it. it. Also increases the incorporation of nitrogen into the material. And according to the literature, what we've started to see is that it seems to be independently modifying the valence band only. So ultimately what we could end up with is a material system where we can independently tune the conduction and the valence bands to get particular properties, potentially looking to suppress order recombination and other non-radiative issues that you have with um, three with quantum well structures. Um, this material, as far as we're aware, this is the first type of its this first um, model of its kind being developed. And um, ideally, this will be put into a Schrodinger equation solver to solve the Schrodinger equation for quantum wells eventually. This will allow me to produce a model that we can then use to develop dilute nitrides for. Um, real world structures so we can start to build heterostructures like quantum wells for lasers and then eventually incorporate those into Vixel devices. A really interesting property that we found with dilute nitrides um, is also that it seems to have better temperature stability than indium phosphide based materials. 
So because the host material band gap is significantly larger than indium phosphide, when you have wells, quantum wells that have the same depth and energy, you end up with less of an electron overflow. So there's a possibility that these devices might actually end up outperforming indium phosphide devices quite significantly with little optimization as we start to develop um, dilute nitride lasers. When we're considering comparing with indium phosphide, one of the big things that comes up is cost. So a big issue of indium phosphide, as we've discussed previously in this conference so far, is that it's incredibly expensive. We're limited by wafer size. Indium phosphide edge emitting devices have to have a facet cleave and the chip size is incredibly large. The fabrication is also complex. When you're looking at a gallium arsenide dilute nitride based Vixel, we can get around a lot of these problems. The wafer cost is significantly lower. We get larger wavelength. We get larger wafer sizes as well. We don't need a facet cleave for Vixel devices. We have small chip sizes and very simple short fabrication routes. This makes them incredibly manufacturable and could potentially reduce the cost of the final devices, even if the growth of dilute nitride material may be initially quite expensive. To conclude then, Dilute nitrides are a novel 3,5 nitride semiconductor alloy. They're able to occupy the same wavelength range as indium phosphide. We've got potentially superior temperature stability and low manufacturing costs. And yeah, I would love to hear any questions that people have on this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, move to the floor for questions. In the middle. Really nice talk. Uh, you sort of saying that Vixels are the future for, for this technology. If you could make an edge emitter with these bigger wafer sizes, there's still some scale up. One of the advantages of edge emitters is you can also integrate modulators and other components to it. So I, I wouldn't, you know, I think you're, you're onto a really good thing here, but it's not, you know, not necessarily just Vixel. It could be edge emitter. Yeah, absolutely. That's completely correct. And I think the initial stages for developing this material are going to be with edge emitters. It's just going to be simpler because with certain ways of growing calibration materials, for example, we can grow that into an edge emitting structure and produce edge emitters, the kind of simple fabric perotypes of quite a rapid turnaround um, as part of the assessment of whether this material is going to be viable, act the way we want it to. So yeah, it's definitely a good candidate for edge emitting lasers. But if we're going, you know, shooting for the moon, that kind of thing, we may as well aim for Vixels if we can get them because they have some distinct advantages over edge emitters. Okay, I think we actually have a question on Zoom if we uh, want to take things virtual for a second. Hello, so this is from Manoj and he asks, so he's talking about, so dilute nitrides has been investigated for the past couple of decades, and they're known to have high electron concentrations in, in, in three arsenic or antimony materials. What will you do to facilitate a diode that's better than a non-dilute 3,5? And what about the non-uniformity of, of alloying the quaternary into bulk or in a quantum well? I didn't catch all of that. Um, okay, I don't really understand <laughs> the question, so I can ask you again. It was the first part of that. I think was it through the electron mobility? Uh, high electron concentration. Dilute nitrides have a high electron concentration in three arsenic or antimony material. Um, so I can answer the question on uniformity quite simply. Uh, essentially, there's been a lot of progress in the growth of three fives over the last couple of decades. And what we've seen actually is this massive increase in uniformity in equivalent indium phosphide quaternary materials. We now have very good composition control over those. And it's not unreasonable to suggest that we could probably apply the same techniques that have been used for quaternary materials in the indium phosphide material system and use, that, use those techniques to improve the dilute nitrides. A lot of the early dilute nitrides um, were grown using, for example, just nitrogen as a radical in an MBE kit, whereas now there's more research that's been looking at nitrogen irradiation, so growing a quaternary structure and then irradiating that with nitrogen before going on and growing your next layers. So there's definitely techniques that can be used to improve the quality vastly over what's been grown before. 
Okay, cool. Um, I think we're out of time for questions, but please do find Tom. Do you please find Tom during the break. Um, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much. Okay, and to finally conclude the PhD talks, uh, we have Bogdan Ratu, who is Cardiff University and is under the supervision of Chiang Li, uh, and his industrial partner is Rockley Photonics. Take it away, Bogdan. Okay, hi everyone. I am going to give a short presentation on Tunnel Lab Taxi, which promises to be a defect free method of integrating Five 3 on Series 10. So, before we get onto that, uh, I should probably justify why we're even trying to do this. So, all of us know about Moore's Law. We know that computational power has been growing exponentially. However, the issue right now is not in computation power, it is in data transfer. It's getting the information to those transistors. And there are issues with, with this, both on chip level and on larger data com fiber level. On chip level, copper interconnects are starting to reach their limits. And on data com level, we have issues with transferring the electrical signal onto photonic signal onto the fiber. So one solution to this is integrating optical communications for inter-chip and inter-server communication. Now, thankfully, this has been widely researched. Silicon photonics exists. It is a mature technology that makes use of um, the same manufacturing techniques as CMOS, which makes it a good tool to be integrated into CMOS, as you can see here in this diagram we can just grow the photonic circuit directly on top of the CMOS. Uh, however, the issue with this is that this is made out of silicon and silicon is a very bad material for lasers because indirect band gap. So we have to look at three, five semiconductors as a light source for this. And that has certain challenges, uh, but it has been achieved, uh, particularly the main method of this now is with bonding. So we grow the 3.5 on a 3.5 wafer, which as we've seen today, is really expensive. And then from there on, we can either do, um, we can either do wafer bonding in which we stick the 3.5 on top and then process it, or we can process it onto the, onto the 3.5 wafer and then put the uh, chips onto silicon. Uh, now, this works, but it is quite time consuming and it is very costly. Uh, the materials are expensive, particularly the wafers. Um, obviously, the wafers are smaller, so wafer bonding, there's a mismatch there. And the yield is not that great. So, if you want to advance to a much higher scale, we are going to have to use epitaxy. However, uh, epitaxy is difficult. You can see here, there are a lot of defects when doing direct epitaxy of 3.5 on silicon. Uh, so we need to find ways around that. Thankfully, uh, scientists are really resourceful and they've come up with many ideas for that. So one of that is nanowires. They are dislocation free due to their small contact area between the 3.5 material and silicon. And they provide quite a wide design range. They have many parameters that we can control, uh, size, shape, distribution, composition, um, uh, core shells, axial nanowires. There are control, so they're, they're very viable. Uh, however, they're, got, they're grown on 111 silicon, which is not compatible with current CMOS, which is grown on uh, 001. And there's also the issue of turning these nanowires into a device because they are a vertical structure, whereas most CMOS and silicon photonics, they are lateral structure. They are in plane with the wafer. Um, some progress has been made uh, towards this. So if you look at uh, big group nano ridges, for example, uh, they have many of the same um, uh, benefits and issues. So. They are nano ridges that are dislocation free, especially on the top layer. 
they are CMOS compatible this time. Uh, they are grown on 001 silicon. However, the issue of publication still remains. It is a vertical structure. And there's also the issue of where the strain relaxation happens, which is in the V group. And in there, there is going to be a very high different density. And as it happens, that's where the electrical contacts are going to go. So that is quite challenging. Now, here is our solution to this. So, tunnel epitaxy works by changing the growth direction from the vertical direction we've seen before to a lateral direction. So, okay, this works, nice. So, the structure is as follows. We have a window here. After the window, there is a tunnel bounded by nitride layers on top and bottom. And at the end, there is the silicon surface. Uh, precursors are going to be flowing in through the window, through the tunnel. They're going to reach the silicon surface, and then they are going to grow outwards laterally. Now, this is, well, this has the promise of being defect free because, because of several factors. So, first of all, the silicon surface there is a 111 surface. The wafer itself is 001, but because of the, uh, because of the edge, that's the 111 surface, which means antiphase boundaries are going to be eliminated. Uh, of course, there are going to be dislocations, but because of the high aspect ratio of the tunnel, the dislocations are going to quickly hit the nitride walls. And it has been found uh, that most, uh, most of the strain relax relaxation here actually happens through stacking faults, not dislocations which are confined at the interface between the 3.5 and silicon. So if all of our defects are combined there, all of this material is potentially defect-free. Uh, of course, this is a planar structure, which makes integration into any kind of optical system, uh, well, much easier than before. Uh, this can be patterned using traditional, uh, traditional fabrication techniques. And here, uh, just a quick callback to the first time this has been uh, introduced um, about 30 years ago. They tried to uh, uh, they tried to use tunnel epitaxy to grow uh, silicon on insulator, and only in the last two years or so, uh, we have actually begun using this for 3.5 on silicon. So we've come quite a long way since then. Now, that's good and all, but does it actually work? So here we have some preliminary results. We have managed to grow gallium arsenide inside the tunnels. So here we have the window that you've seen in the previous diagram, the tunnel and the silicon wall. The big white blobs are the gallium arsenide islands we have grown. So we can see that here we've managed to grow in a tunnel that is five microns wide. If we increase the growth time on this, we could potentially fill out the whole tunnel. That is, however, going to take a while. Um, it's worth noting here that the tunnel will impact the, the growth rate because, well, because of the way precursors diffuse, they're going to be more concentrated next to the window and less concentrated next to the silicon wall. So if we have a shorter tunnel, we're going to have a faster growth rate. OK, so we could increase the growth time, or we could just increase the precursor flux and keep the growth time the same. And we have done so. So here, we can start seeing some crystal facets on our nucleation layer. Uh, this implies that they are monocrystalline, which is good. That is, to be, uh, that is what we are looking for. Now, of course, here, there's still islands. So if you continue increasing the precursor flux, we start merging them into these gallium arsenide slabs. Uh, now, of course, the surface is still quite rough, but we have achieved about three microns of gallium arsenide growth. And with slight optimization, we should be able to get a nice, clean growth facet here. Uh, of course, there are still many studies that need to be done on this platform. We're not sure, for example, how the length of the cavity impacts this growth. Uh, 
um, in this case here we have uh, we have very long cavities maybe a short boxier cavity would change things we're not sure about that yet uh, however moving onwards we have also managed to grow indium phosphide this is a low temperature nucleation here um, and here we have a 10 micron tunnel and we can see that the growth rate seems to be higher than gallium arsenide despite the uh, larger tunnel size uh, we've attributed that to larger indium diffusion length. Um, and again, as before, if we increase the growth time here, we can potentially fill a 10 micron wide slab of potentially defect free indium phosphide. Uh, however, we still have issues which are in the early stages here. So we, you can see we have some selectivity issues here where indium phosphide is deposited just on top of the window. And this is obviously not good because it stops the precursors from going inside. And this growth facet here is very far from ideal. So we really need to optimize our growth conditions to get nice, smooth, uniform growth. Okay, so we're not actually the only ones doing this. It is quite a uh, interesting technique for quite a lot of people. So from Hong Kong, um, they have used a very similar arrangement to ours. The window is a bit different, but uh, of course, everyone's going to do it a bit differently. Uh, they have managed to create a high speed uh, photo detector with low dark current. IBM has achieved a room temperature micro displacer, um, which they compare to a bonded structure, a similar bonded structure. And we can see that the, um, they, they, the performance is very comparable. Uh, and UCSB has proven the possibility of lateral heterostructure integration using this platform. So to conclude, we need to find ways to introduce optical communications uh, into our computational techniques. Uh, and Epitaxy has the potential of providing a method, a platform for this optical integration. And we have shown some promising results for gallium arsenide and indium phosphide. Thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you very much, Bob. the interesting talk. Um, yeah, any questions? Uh, yeah, one in the front. So you, you're nucleating the growth at several different sites. So what happens when those merge? Do you get antiphase domains or any issue with the merging? Um, so that, uh, that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, it is a, so even when doing planar epitaxy, you usually start with a nucleation layer that merges just together um, as, you, as you grow. So uh, that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, there is, of course, there is the promise of, uh, there is, there's the possibility of merging defects, like you said, uh, but since we have monocrystalline growth, that is somewhat reduced. Okay, we have time for one more. Okay, well, question for me then would be, what kind of um, defect densities are you getting in the epi layer at the moment? Uh, right, we haven't measured that yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we are, we're actually going to, do this defect measurement like next week so um, we're mostly interested in um, uh, right now we are interested in uh, seeing the defect propagation mechanisms so uh, i have said for example that uh, most of the sternal relaxation is going to happen due to stacking faults we need to verify that uh, we need to verify if merging boundaries exist uh, we need to verify all of that and afterwards we're going to be able to optimize the growth as much as you can to reduce this defect Okay, well, thank you very much, Bogdan. Thank you.
case that concludes um, all of the PhD speakers.